Um, so yeah, welcome everybody. Um, thanks for joining us today. Um, and I, I wanna start out by thanking Gina um, for proposing that we do this series this semester and, and for nudging us to put this program together. I really appreciate it, so thank you. Um, and also wanna thank Karen Malpete, Milena Popov, and, and Mary Ting for being here um, today and doing this panel. There are three veteran teachers in the environmental justice program who've taught our core courses now um, for six years, basically since the program has been in existence. Um, and I'm glad that they could come today to share their um, work in the classroom and their ideas. Um, and I thought I just, I wanted to say a few things about the program, um, just maybe to just situate us for this series. I mean, the first thing I should probably say, um, currently the program coordinator is um, Sandra, Sandra Swenson and Kate Good in science. Um, Kate is here with us. Sandra is teaching right now, so she sends her regrets. Um, she couldn't be here. Um, I coordinated the program um, from its inception until last fall uh, when Sandra took over. Um, and the program was um, first conceived in the wake of Hurricane Sandy. So we have had a connection to environmental <laughs> catastrophe, unfortunately, from the very beginning. Um, and we started offering courses um, in the minor in, in 2014. And the minor was from the beginning um, conceived as a transdisciplinary minor um, that was meant to complement the, the majors across the college, because we obviously recognize that the topics that we're talking about in this series and that the minor is devoted to are not topics that any one department or discipline uh, can take on. These are very complex matters that require collaboration between the sciences, the social sciences and the humanities. Um, so we created two core courses um, that are both located in the general education program to sort of reach the broadest possible range of students of uh, the environmental justice course that Karen, Milena and Mary have all been teaching and an introduction to sustainability studies that um, Milena has also been teaching. Um, and then um, there are 10 departments um, that are part of the program that offer electives for our students. Um, and so let me just see if I can share my screen. Give me just a second. go. I am almost there. Let's see if this will work. Okay, can you see the screen now with our program pages? Um, and so this is this was created as, as a venture really for collaboration across the curriculum. And I'm part of what I, I think we're all hoping for this series is that we can generate ideas and, and impulses for people to maybe, in addition to the courses that are already there, integrate assignments or uh, units into, into your courses so we can broaden this out and reach as many students um, with these important topics as possible. Um, so I just wanted to show you a few things um, and I will put the, what is this, sorry, I will put the uh, URL in the chat later, but you can also see it up there. Um, and just wanted to point you to some resources that the program has already um, available for you via our website. Um, we don't have to walk through this in detail, but if you come to the front page, you'll see a tag cloud here. Um, and you can follow these tags to the topics. Um, they will mainly lead you to blog posts by uh, both faculty and students um, that may be helpful for you in your classes. Um, just take a look what you might find. Um, 
there are here some uh, faculty publications, um, some are linked articles, so there's some resources there that uh, might be helpful to you. Um, there's more information about the minor here, obviously, but I mainly wanted to show you the web resources that we have available that I think can all be useful for teaching. Um, I don't know if you know, but the library has an environmental justice research um, guide um, that is quite helpful. Um, I've linked here to the Teaching and Learning Center pages that uh, Gina and her team have put together. Um, then there are a variety of websites here that I think provide uh, general resources that might be useful. Um, you can take a look. I just wanted to point out a couple of them which have explicit teaching resources. Um, this is here the Astley page. Uh, while it's the Association for Study of Literature and the Environment, the syllabi and assignments you'll find there are quite useful also for um, people from other uh, fields. So you might look there for some inspiration. If you're in the humanities, there's the Teaching Climate Change in the Humanities site, uh, which has reading lists and resources. Um, and then the NAACP page um, has a PDF, which teaching, teaching resources and lesson plans. Uh, while these are mainly geared for high schools, um, again, um, they are quite helpful for inspiration and you, know, you can use them, adapt them, um, and otherwise just play around with some of the resources here, but I think there's a good deal of material that you can use if you're interested in, in developing units or courses. Um, all right, that was all I just wanted to quickly show you. Let me stop sharing. Um, and with that, without further ado, I will hand it over to our panelists. And I thought we, you know, we would, um, each of our panelists will talk for about 10 minutes. And I thought it might be nice to just leave a few minutes after each talk for immediate questions. Um, and then we should still have at least 15 to 20 minutes at the end for general discussion. Um, so I thought we'd start out with Mary Ting, um, who has been teaching not just in the environmental justice program, but also in the art department for a long time. Um, and Mary, why don't you start and share with us what you'd like to say. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. Can you see it? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, Okay, well, first off, before I even get into this, thank you so much, um, Alexander and Gina. Um, I'm really happy to be in this program today and also in the environmental justice program in general. And I have to say that teaching in two different, in environmental justice and in the art department to me makes so much sense. It really keeps me sane. Um, and I don't think I could do one without the other because I think they really, um, link up and it really um, makes it possible to do the other one. So um, as far as what I do in my classroom, um, I've always started out with um, students introducing themselves and, and talking about their relationship to nature. And I asked them a series of questions which the students seem to really enjoy, that opportunity to really ponder about their own personal relationship, um, what it means to them, what wonder means to them. And then recently I of course included um, pandemic refle reflections and also their understanding of the interrelationships um, and the injustices as a way to start out. And that's really in so many ways how so much of what I do in every week, I design these PowerPoint lectures that every semester I update because the news is changing so constantly. Um, and we want to be timely. I don't use textbooks. Um, I do have readings that I provide the PDFs for. Um, and I use a wide variety of things to keep it very interesting, timely, and, and animated. Um, so I, for example, you know, I guess in the beginning about understanding where we are 
um, and this leads into their midterm project about first thinking locally and our environmental issues right outside our door, but um, thinking about the historical cultural context, because as an artist, I'm always um, doing that type of research, uh, looking at the past to understand our current situation and where to go in the future. Um, so, you know, using the Manahata site, um, Wallachia, and seeing what was existed on these blocks before the flora and fauna that was there. Um, I bring in um, NYBG and Daniel Atha, a botanist who does New York City Ecoflora Project. Um, now I also do a panel. I have the person who's the steward from um, the East River Park steward talking about flooding and then comparing it with other things like, for example, like Katrina. And I use this incredible, beautiful, beautiful graphic nonfiction called Drowned by Don Brown. And I, I highly recommend it because it's not only just gorgeously illustrated, but it is incredibly well researched and the students really react very strongly to it. Um, and then I also supplement with a lot of my own photos too as well, like this is outside my door um, during Hurricane Sandy. Uh, I had also done an exhibition for John Jay and this um, site is still available, uh, Endangered Exhibition. And um, I, I think it's another way of telling stories and getting people interested, a little bit different than the standard news, um, but all of course very well researched. Um, and all these are from artists that are very invested in their issues and actually have NGOs um, that they founded. So again, another example of another way of tackling a topic. Um, so William Poada, who did all this extensive research about the linkage of the, for example, the Koch family or the Sackler family. Um, so, and then I also do a midterm and a final, which is also just sort of moving forward from where those weekly assignments are. Um, and again, it's asking them to investigate what's outside their door as far as an environmental issue goes. And it's a new thing for them. A lot of them get nervous at first because they've never done that kind of more investigative research. Um, but I give them you know, a lot of guidelines and help for some. It's the first time they might even contact their community board or attend a meeting. Um, there are all different ways of tackling this project, but in the end, students really enjoy it. They do a short um, presentation for the entire class. Um, their peer reviews. The final is going a little bit broader where they do an investigation of the full circle of a product, whether it's your favorite coffee or chocolate, so that they're understanding the, the global connections of the raw material to the labor issues, um, to the shipping, to the, you know, the, all the human rights along the way, the manufacturer, the post-consumer waste, etc. Um, so they're understanding the links and, and students really, they produce um, advocacy posters, they do all different things. And I think this is one of their favorite projects actually. Um, also interspersed with everything is that I bring in guest speakers. It varies every semester, but generally there are four to five. Um, and I feel like this allows them an opportunity to see, you know, working people in the field. Also, it's a, an opportunity for networking connections and, and the reality that there are all different types of jobs out there. So sometimes they include someone from enforcement, like Department of Environmental Conservation, or from the legal end with Earth Justice, also community, like would we act for environmental justice or um, policy with corporate accountability, as well as science um, and then local advocacy groups. Um, we also, when possible, um, obviously not now, but we, you know, I would always have one kind of going outside um, when weather permitted it, whether it's visiting the Gavit Center and their green roof, um, seeing the amazing things that New York has that most people don't realize. We, one semester we took a bird walk with Jeffrey Ward, who is the youngest um, top um, bird guide. Um, Jeffrey's here in the middle, um, and we did Street Central Park. That was a lot of fun as well, and really, I think, revealing and eye-opening for the students. Um, 
Jeffrey is part of a group that um, is organizing on behalf of black birders since the whole incident happened with um, Christian Cooper at Central Park. Um, I also have extras um, because I'm always doing projects or things that um, I can invite students to attend. Um, so when one year, a bunch of us went to the New York City Ivory Crush in Central Park and actually got to crush ivory. So these are some of the EJ students and actually getting to select a piece of ivory and put it in the crusher. Um, so these are obviously after school. Um, and then some of my projects where I was going through um, 14th Street and what it used to be, and we were actually remapping it, like what was there before the putting back the, the signage for the um, imaginary signage for the hickory forest and bringing back the beavers. I also, um, students got to participate and I did it as well as, as researchers for this publication. It would have, uh, this publication is not possible without us. Um, and then from that, you know, I think there's a whole uh, given exchange between myself as a teacher and myself as an artist, thinker, writer, researcher. Um, and now I'm doing other work that I've actually even hired some students to work with me on. Um, so, you know, I feel like it's completely, the students are there very active as um, speakers and doing their short presentations as well. Um, so we all learn from each other. And that's it. Right. Thanks so much, Mary. Really appreciate it. Um, so I think we should open it up for questions just for a few minutes. Um, so please, if anybody has a question, there's few enough of us here that you can wave at the screen or if you're not visible, you can just raise your hand under the participants button. Yes, Margaret, please. You just need to unmute yourself. You're, cur you're currently muted. Yeah, um, I just wanted to say, I put this in the chat, but one day uh, driving into John Jay, I heard on an NPR report that 18 year olds are eligible to join community boards. That's great. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, and actually, students have actually attended and then they update it, you know, because a lot of times the meetings are happening after our projects are done. Um, and then some students have even given presentations. Um, I had one student do a report about how where he lived in the neighborhood would not allow, for example, homes to put solar panels up. And then because they thought it was ugly, um, <laughs> so he actually um, made a presentation and gave it to the neighborhood board. And because of his presentation, the neighborhood board was actually just reconsidering the whole thing. So um, yeah, the students have been pretty incredible with that. And also it's just this whole thing about empowering each other. Um, like there's things that you could do, simple things like calling up 311 if you don't have a, a tree, if your tree pit is empty you can request one. Um, so all these different things. Um, so we continually add to each other's pool of knowledge. But that's great that they can be eligible. Actually, one of my speakers, um, he, Daniel Athe, he actually with a whole bunch of other naturalists have con are in constant, every meeting that their community board does, the naturalists attend so that they can have an actual say and that everything's done with a really environmental conscious uh, philosophy. So that's great about students at, um, being able to be part of the board. Thank you. Any other questions? I, I would also say that one of the things I find is that it's so hard because the, the topic is so broad. So I try and pick the big headings you know, whether it's about our oceans or about our food production. Um, and then from there, um, you know, try and get the bigger picture, you know, with the relationship of overfishing to say seafood slavery, 
so that they're always seeing the connections. And then from that, they can go on to do their final and you know, be very cognizant that there's probably going to be a human rights issue along the way. So that's it, building up of um, realizations. Could I ask another question? Sure, please. Um, do you feel, um, Mary, that your students become activists in a in a sustained way afterwards? And or is there um, some kind of a climate student climate organization at John Jay with which they can become linked? Well, there's definitely the student club, but I have found that many students, not many, but well, handfuls of students come in already with an activist mindset um, or are able to from another like activism about labor or human rights or immigrant rights are able to make the connection. Um, and then definitely there's a portion that um, because of the course I feel have pivoted or for sure are gonna carry this into whatever field they do. But like, for example, I have a handful of six students right now that I'm doing um, grad school recommendations and they're all trying to incorporate that, whether it's urban design, sustainability, Oh, Lord. So yeah, I think it's growing. Good. I, uh, I'm in the process of, oh, there's David. So um, just one more question and then we should move on to Karen. Please go ahead, David. Uh, yes, in, in brief, I'm curious, you, you all have way more experience in, in this than I do, but I notice in my uh, field, uh, financial reporting, there is a movement to get corporations to report uh, their uh, sustainability measures using whatever metrics are currently uh, uh, adhere, uh, are currently put forth. The problem is that the standardization is, is lacking. Do you guys see like um, the, the at the corporate level? Is this more part of the problem? You think, or, or is this? I mean, is this lip service, or do you think like? Where, where activism is headed, where this is going to be useful, it's not really going to be at the corporate level. You know what I mean? Because I, I, I recognize, even though it is my field, that there is a lot of, you know, window dressing going on. I'm just curious what you all think about uh, these kind of measures and movements at the corporate level. Um, that That's one of the things that we definitely discuss um, when we're looking at things like the Coke industry or the Sacklers or the... Mo um, and I have corporate accountability come in. Um, so where they're trying to actually change policy. Um, and for sure there's greenwashing, but I think there is some movement that's real where stockholders are bringing up all these proposals where they're you know, forcing the issue, um, whether it's with Pepsi or with any of the corporations. So I think it's a mixed bag. And certainly they're, they're very cognizant of the public opinion I mean, there's that big case going on right now with um, the chocolate, with the cocoa and the human rights, human slavery issues. So that's a big one that just came up. So I think it's gonna come up more and more. So. Yeah, Th yeah thank you. I, I have a, a, most of my direct experience with uh, Exxon Mobil and that was not um, yeah. oh, Chevron. All satisfactorily, <laughs> at least from the perspective of no. All right. I think, in, you know, in the interest of time, we do need to move on. Just wanted to say real quick, I put the link to the um, John Jay Student Club page and the uh, Environmental Club blog in the chat. So if you have students who want to get involved, you can point them to the Environmental Club and, of course, also um, to me or Sandra or Kate um, to get information about the program. Um, but we should move on to Karen, um, who has also been teaching since the first hour of the program and is also in uh, theater and music. So please, Karen, if you wanna share with us. Hi, thank you. Thanks, Alexander. Thank you everyone for being here and for having me here. Uh, this is a real pleasure to teach in this program. Um, I, I, my, I find the students wonderful. I find the interdisciplinary aspect of the program terrific and the colleagues also terrific and all of us coming at it from 
slightly different perspectives that overlap and you know sort of broaden our mind. I'm going to try and share my screen. Um, hmm. I don't see what I want here. Uh, yes, I will get it. Um, yeah. Um, here we go. Okay. Uh, yeah. So this is um, my website. I'm a, I'm a playwright. I'm an eco playwright. And uh, in 2012, I started rehearse, uh, researching climate change and climate scientists. Um, this is the play that resulted from that uh, research. Um, we opened it in 2014. We took it to Paris for the Art Cup in 2015. We redid it in uh, March um, of 2018 at La Mama. These are photos that will just scroll by while I read to you the kind of rationale behind the play, which, which is called Extreme Weather, W-H-E-T-H-E-R, obviously, <clears throat> asking a question. That's Nancy Romer, who's a climate activist who spoke uh, one night. Um, so ours is an interdisciplinary program and I learned climate science by writing a play. I was struck by the human dilemma of the climate scientists, which prefigured the human dilemma of many, many medical professionals today. What do you do if what you know to be true is not believed? What do you do if the government censors you and the fossil fuel industry attacks you for simply trying to share the seriousness of what you know? This seemed to me to be a classical dramatic dilemma. Um, Scientists like Jim Hansen um, and Jennifer Francis, whose science and lives inform my play Extreme Weather, chose to become social activists. Jim resigned from his longtime job as head of climate science at NASA in the very same week that we did the first reading of this play. And he spoke after the, after the first reading of the play. Um, uh, I'll come back to that. Uh, so scientists like Jim Hansen, uh, Jim resigned from his longtime job as head of climate science at NASA because the government for which he worked was censoring his research, our government. He had gone to Congress in 1988 to tell Congress that climate change had begun um, and they ignored him. He was ignored and vilified. By, 19, by 2013, he'd had enough. Hansen was arrested outside the White House protesting the Keystone Pipeline and resigned his top government job. Um, Extreme Weather is based upon his story and that of Jennifer Francis, Arctic ice scientist, who was among the first to recognize that a quickly warming Arctic and fast melting ice was going to seriously affect the weather in the Northern Hemisphere, causing the sorts of extreme weather we've experienced just now in Texas, which is how I started every semester we have a climate disaster. So we've been talking about Texas too. Uh, Jenner, and Jennifer was attacked also. So I came to see climate scientists as classic dramatic heroes. The knowledge they amassed from their life's work forced them to make life-changing heroic choices. And this in part is the story of my play. What do you do when the truth you know is censored and attacked? Um, so uh, on this website, there are lots of, um, Whoops, why am I not scrolling? Okay, so here's one. Dale Jameson, who teaches at NYU, wrote a book called um, uh, Hope in Dark Times, and he spoke after one of our performances. There are lot, there's Jim Hansen after opening night with the cast. Um, so there are lots of uh, uh, resources on this actual website, a whole list of people who've spoken after the plays, and we have their videotapes up there. Um, so, there's Jim again, and, and there's Jennifer Francis speaking, and Jim, um, and other people, Andy Revkin, who wrote about the play. So there, there are lots of resources uh, here. Um, I'm not teaching, the play is published. I'm not, I'm not, um, I wanna get out of shared screen. Uh, I'm not teaching the play this, this um, <laughs> I don't know how to do this. It's uh, happening on top of your screen, Karen, all the way uh, up on top. You should see stop sharing. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm because I'm not very big here. Let's see. Stop sharing. 
I don't see it. But anyway, let me, oh, I see it. It's right up there. Okay, great. Thank you. On the top of my screen. Thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. So, um, so that's, that's, uh, uh, this, this, um, this semester when the, I, uh, the Texas, um, uh, crisis, which is ongoing. Um, Jennifer, who is the Arctic ice scientist who, who knows a lot about the Arctic ice melt and its effect on the weather. Uh, I wrote to the class specifically, I asked her to address it. So that, so her answer, the, her uh, discussion is up on the, uh, for the class and they're dialoguing about uh, the Arctic ice. Uh, but I also wanted to share uh, an assignment, a writing assignment that they're working on this week um, because I think good writing is, is not separable from good reading. And they're trying to teach writing in a vacuum away from reading is a, is a lost cause. So uh, I give them um, a little uh, three paragraphs to read. I'm gonna read the paragraphs to you and then I'm gonna read just at random the first five essays that I read in response to this. I'm not gonna read the whole essay. I'll just read you a little bit of what they wrote. Uh, this is from um, Thomas Berry's uh, book, The Great Work. It's called The Meadow Across the Creek. So I asked them to read these three paragraphs and then write their own meadow moment. This is Thomas Berry. My own understanding of the great work began when I was quite young. At, a time I was some, uh, at the time, I was some 11 years old. My family was moving from a more settled part of a small southern town out to the edge of town where the new house was being built. The house, not yet finished, was situated in, on a slight incline. Down below was a small creek, and there across the creek was a meadow. It was an early afternoon in late May when I first wandered down the incline, crossed the creek, and looked out over the scene. The field was covered with white lilies rising above the thick grass, a magic moment. This experience gave to my life something that seems to explain my thinking at a more profound level than almost any other experience I can remember. It was not only the lilies, it was the singing of the cricket, crickets and the woodlands and the distance and the clouds and the clear sky. It was not something conscious that happened just then. I went about my life as any young person might do. Perhaps it was not simply this moment that made such a deep impression upon me. Perhaps it was a sensitivity that was developed throughout my childhood. Yet as the years pass, this moment returns to me. And whenever I think about my basic life attitude and the whole trend of my mind and the causes to which I've given my efforts, I seem to come back to this moment and the impact it had, has had on my feelings for what is real and worthwhile in life. This early experience, it seems, has become normative for me throughout the entire range of my thinking. Whatever preserves and enhances this meadow in the natural cycle of its transformation is good. Whatever opposes this meadow or negates it is not good. My life orientation is that simple. It is also that pervasive. It applies in economics and political orientation as well as education and religion. So then they write their meadow moments. And one of the things I like about this assignment is that it, obviously it evokes memory. Um, and they're not always beautiful memories, but I'll just, just let me read. My, me my meadow moment was when I was a young girl. Growing up, I was so attached to my grandmother. She loved taking care of her garden. Woke up early every morning to get ready, sweep the floors outside, and start to water the flowers and plants. Oh, and plant new ones. My grandmother would teach me the little, the little things on how flowers and trees were living things, and it's important to take care of them. She told me she used to talk to her flowers, and I remember being so confused. I asked her, why do you talk to them if they can't talk back? She said to me, Kayla, they can listen. If you believe, they, they grow wiser. Oh, they grow off water and sun, but they grow beautifully with kindness and nurture. Ever since then, I appreciated every flower and living thing I've seen. So that's part of one response. Here's another one. Also, I saw the fireflies at night. Fireflies dance freely in the air like dancers. At this moment, I seem to be one with nature. My friend tried to grab a few fireflies to take home, but I told him that fireflies belong to nature and no one can be above nature. 
For example, SpongeBob, SquarePants, and Patrick Starr like to catch jellyfish, but when they catch the jellyfish, they will release the jellyfish directly instead of taking them home. We need to learn how to live with nature instead of trampling on beautiful nature. Um, uh, uh, there are just two more. One, what's great, one thing about this assignment too is that the memories are not always happy. Um, based, on the meadow moment, based on the meadow across the creek by Thomas Berry, a uh, meadow moment can be defined as the experience gained when walking on the ground covered with white lilies rising above the grass. The singing of the crickets and the woodlands in the distance gives a classical experience of loneliness and mixture of anxiety and fear. My own experience of near death is drawn from the village back in the days when I was eight years old. My father was in the army and he had been posted to the war at the border of the country. After the completion of the war, my father returned home with an aggressive and traumatizing mood, which could probably have been caused by the hard times he experienced during the war. I was not much aware of the character of my father before he went to war, but luckily I was privileged to read people's minds and ascertain their mo mo motives. The drastic change of my father's character made my mother prefer me to the strange man that my father had become after the war due to the awful behaviors he demonstrated. And he goes on with a memory about his father taking him on a very dangerous mountain climb and he, he confronts a snake. So um, just some examples of how the, the, that writing assignment works. Um, do I have a few more minutes or am I out of time? Um, maybe a, a few. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, I, I can stop there, actually. Let me stop there. I, I mean, I would, could talk about the whole design of the course. I would just want to say at the end, we talk a lot about changing consciousness and how we have to change not only behavior, but consciousness and the connection between individual change and societal change. So, and, and many other issues we talk about. I'll stop there. Great, and you know we can also possibly use a question for more on that. So if you know we again have a few minutes for questions for Karen. So if anybody would like to ask a question, please. Margaret, please. So who are these students? They're so expressive. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> They're from many different countries, you can see. I mean, I, the one I didn't read was also a student from Bangladesh. Um, this, this young man from the war, um, he doesn't uh, identify what war, but I, I think it's one of the Balkan wars. It could be any number of the little wars, but they're all over. Also, I've had, I've had two firemen in, uh, not this semester, but in previous classes, um, which has been very interesting, very interesting for them and very interesting for, for me. So they're upper class men and women? Uh, Juniors and seniors? Uh, mainly. Yeah. yeah. It's a, it's a 300 level course, Margaret. So it's, a, they, they, you know, they will need to be a little more advanced to, to take the class. These are, yeah. not, these are not freshmen in the right. course. And are they are they in a particular arts oriented major? No, they're from all different majors. Okay. Yeah. yeah. No, the the uh, yeah. <laughs> in fact, I would say most of them are not from an arts oriented major. Yeah, I should. But I do have some that go from theater to EJ and back and forth, but that's a few, very few. Maybe I should say, maybe that wasn't clear in the beginning, but both of the core courses of the program are part of the general education program. So the environmental justice course is in the 300 level justice core of the college option. So we specifically wanted these courses to be part of the general education program to draw students from across the college. So many of the students who enroll, um, enroll to fulfill a general education requirement and they can come from you know any department across the college really and it, it really does make for extremely interesting class discussions in, you know in my, in my experience another question for karen If if not, maybe we can come back to to this in, in the at the end. I you know I should say real quick that um, I'm actually quite uh, I was happy to find out 
few, you know, I think it was back in 2019 that uh, fi the fire science major encourages their majors to take the environmental justice minor. So it's, I've also seen more uh, fire science students in my courses. So there is some, um, some synergies are starting to develop at the college really um, in over, over the past four or five years that are very encouraging to see. Um, all right, um, let's move on to Milena then, who is also in the environmental justice program and art and music like Mary. So please, Milena. Okay, so I'll start sharing my screen. And Okay, so I'll start with this first picture, which are our very first students. Do you guys hear me? See my screen? Yes. Yes, okay. Um, so these are the very first four students in our program, and I would like to start with them. When I started teaching in 2014, Introduction to Sustainability Studies, we only had four students we have a very new program. Um, and from this point on, we really grew so much. Now we have so many sections, so many courses, and they're all full with students. I just want to say that um, I'm excited about that. And, and I believe not only that, because this is general ed courses, not only that I think attract our students, but also the topic itself. I think more and more students are interested in these topics and that, that is great. So let me uh, continue with my slides. And a little bit, I have an idea about some theoretical approaches here to how to bring these topics into, into across the curriculum to different classes. And something that I see now that what I do, Karen and uh, Mary do the same, uh, we might just use different terminology, but we all start with ethics of care. I think it's really important to, to start making connections between our own personal values in life, in, in our community, what really matters to us, and then connect that with environmental justice and sustainability. And you will see right away there are big connections there. And also the students um, need to make those connections first. We need to care first uh, about nature, about our surroundings, about other people, et cetera, to, to make changes. Um, so I think that's the very uh, starting point. And um, in faculty development day back in 2018 um, with Paul Bartlett, which is another uh, um, faculty member in the pro program, we had a workshop um, uh, environmental justice and sustainability across the curriculum. And we used a particular template that I think worked really well. And we described this template and uh, other ideas in this chapter that I have here, um, a book um, cover right here for you. And I have here the chapter information for you below and the link. Um, the, the chapter will be accessible in our library very soon as an ebook. So you can take a look at those ideas of it there. Um, I'll just very quickly say what this is about. It's really finding um, first big ideas, trying to connect big ideas in your course, in your uh, learning objectives in your course and connecting that to environmental justice principles and sustainability principles as well. Um, particularly what we have added here is Core sustainability meta competencies, which I'll show you in the next slide. Another thing, of course, I think that is important to um, collaborate uh, between different departments and the faculty. For example, our program faculty can collaborate with other um, departments on these programs in faculty development workshop, guest speaker visits, or, or even maybe um, collaborative assignments in different disciplines. This is what. I envision um, some kind of a cross course collaboration. I have seen that um, 
that is being developed in some in some other universities. Um, also, what I found very interesting is uh, we can use and what I've been using uh, our campus, our college as a living laboratory where we can um, propose different ideas and different solutions in our uh, department, and that way we can work together with different between different departments and even between facilities. Uh, let's say collaboration with facilities department, which I have done um, in some ideas of greening uh, cafeteria, making making the green roof at the college. My students and I have proposed that. And um, with some ideas, I have also brought my students on the EPA's Campus Rainworks uh, Challenge, um, which is a very good um, competition. Now, um, of course, so having different local uh, speakers um, in guest uh, visits, field trips, etc. And let me move on. So those are sustainability meta competencies that I mentioned. Um, so, uh, system thinking, temporal thinking, interpersonal literacy, ethical literacy, and creativity. Um, and Karen and Mary have mentioned uh, pretty much all this, and they're using this. Um, system thinking, of course, finding connection between different um, sustainability problems, environmental justice problems, we have to find the connections first to understand the complicity, complexity of those issues uh, from the sources to the solutions and anything in between. Um, temporal thinking between past, present and future, learning from the past, learning from indigenous knowledge, for example, learning from past mistakes is what um, Mary also mentioned something similar. And um, Connecting interpersonal literacy, I think is very important. Understanding what other people, what other societies, what other entities, um, political system itself, um, how they're thinking, how they're working and finding connections. Um, and ethical literacy, because all environmental problems are uh, moral problems. And creativity, I think creativity is important. And I, of course, as an artist, uh, I also teach in an art department. Um, I think creativity is important and our students are seeing more and more um, to find solutions, to find ideas, new ideas. We need to be more creative because uh, what brings in the, uh, what will bring us in the future are really our creative thinking, our creative ideas um, to find some solutions um, to unknown problems. And bringing, I think it's important to bring, um, sustainable development goals um, that the UN has developed, even though they're not perfect, but they are touching upon many different uh, sustainability issues and environmental justice issues. Um, so I think because they're making, uh, like I said here, they're making environmental challenges more concrete and actionable. They're giving us ideas how to action on them because a lot of students, they feel like our problems uh, global environmental crisis is too big that we cannot tackle and we cannot do anything. A lot of them uh, feel frustrated about that. Um, and some, some examples uh, of assignments that I do, um, some of the first assignments that I do, I ecological footprint surveys, different types of the footprint surveys I use because I think it's definitely important to, um, for students to see connections between their own personal life, the lifestyle, for example, and environmental issues. How do we all connect and how we can change by changing our um, action? Oh, sorry. I jump to the next slide already. Um, so surveys, um, definitely uh, using different questions, looking at the old broad spectrum of uh, ecological footprint, it really connects different disciplines, politics, economics, chemistry, toxicology, law. Um, and every faculty can create their own questions uh, related to their own discipline, more related maybe to their discipline. Um, I have some examples here. How often do you buy non-recyclable items? How often do you buy recycled paper? Do you reuse things? Um, do you buy locally grown food? Do you use environmentally friendly soap, detergent? Do you use more public transportation, a private car, a taxi? Do you turn off lights as soon as you leave a room? 
So even looking at these questions, you can see all different disciplines are already included here. Or um, this website is also very good, making a very um, um, good um, calculations here, very interesting calculations uh, to see how many planets you need to sustain your lifestyle. And it's, um, you can use that website in your classes. Um, or use social media. My students uh, like making their own surveys and surveying their community, their friends, their family members on different sustainability um, topics and see where they are. So they're learning and they're teaching other people and they, um, they're very proud of that uh, once they learn, once they see um, what other people are thinking. So it's a very um, good teaching moment for them. Um, how do I make some assignments in regards to um, ecological footprint survey? This is one example. Um, one day consumption, uh, visual journal or a self portrait. I do this in not only in eco art and design class that I develop, but also in all different classes that I teach. Uh, different way they could do three day uh, consumption uh, survey or five day, one week. Uh, you can choose the timeline. And, um, and then I asked them to make something out of it, to kind of visualize that um, their consumption, and then to make a comment, to make um, uh, some kind of a realization. What did they learn from this uh, experience, from this journal? Once we see it, um, we can understand better uh, what is our connection. And, um, and think about solutions. How can we, what is the pattern that they see and how they can change that pattern, what they can change, right? And um, another survey that I do is in regards to fashion industry, um, looking at the entire life cycle of fashion industry. Um, we use environmental mapping. I use a lot of environmental map mapping in my classes. This is one of them where students uh, choose 10, uh, 10 of them clothing items or accessories looking at the labels, where they're produced, putting them on the map, um, and looking at um, what, is, uh, what is there, you know, what is the true cost to make this item, to ship this item, um, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and disposal, so entire life cycle of fashion, right? Because fashion is a very, it's the second largest uh, polluting industry. Um, and, and, and we are all involved in that. So we have to find that connection. And then in another assignment, um, sometimes I do it for a midterm project, uh, we make a fashion show, environmental fashion show, where students use their old clothing or materials that they found, like a broken jewelry pieces, and they make something, the new um, garment that they would actually wear. Um, they use also uh, non-toxic dyes, uh, such as turmeric, blueberries, um, coffee, tea, something that is not toxic and available. And they make their own designs, their own clothing that they would wear or their family members would wear. Um, they also learn how to sew um, in those classes. And, and of course, a lot of field trips. I love field trips. Um, I like science uh, experiments a lot. So like a simple science experiments with you a lot in classrooms as a group projects. And once we're in the classroom and, um, and then bringing them to all around the city, as Mary mentioned, uh, we have so much to see around the city, not just exhi exhibits, museums, um, visiting environmental organizations, um, but also looking at the city, looking at the vulnerability of the waterfront. I like to take them on a boat trip to see the uh, coastline, what is on the coast, and then make solutions. Taking them on Gowanus Canal, looking at environmental problems, do the soil testing there. We do that as well. And, uh, and in botanical garden, looking at the plant adaptations. And so um, being a former botanic garden um, tour guide helps a lot. Um, in those. Anyhow, um, I'll stop here. I don't want to go over 10 minutes. So I'm open for any of your questions. So I'm going to stop sharing. And thank you, everybody. Thank you for listening and organizing. And um, here is my website and information here. So I'm open for questions. <laughs>
unmute myself. So uh, thanks, Milena. So we, again, I think we have just time for a few questions from Milena, and then we still have time to open it up for a general discussion. So any questions for Milena specifically? Actually, I have one. Go ahead, Mary. Hey, Milena. Um, only because you teach both um, sustainability and the EJ class, right? So, um, because I only do the EJ class, sometimes I'm always thinking to myself, gee, I wonder if what I'm doing was already covered in sustainability. Not that it would be bad because you can always use repetition, um, but sometimes there are students and you're starting to, I'm starting to see it more and more, students that are minors, EJ minors. So they've taken the sustainability class already and then taking the EJ. So I'm always sort of um, have my, eye out for um, D, am I doing something that's a repeat? So how do you draw the line between the two classes? Mm -hmm. Well, in an environmental justice class, I focus more on the impact of on human body and on different um, groups, right? Um, so more than on environment itself. So that's how I make connections. So I'm covering sustainab sustainability topics, sustainability issues in sustainability class. And then in environmental justice, I focus on the impact on human bodies. Okay. Um, across the world, right? Right. So that's, yeah. So uh, introduction to sustainability is more broad because it's really introduction to all different sustainability problems, right? From climate change to pollution to all that. But environmental justice is really focusing on the impact of human body, yeah. So I have a question. It's this, Lindsay and then Margaret. Lindsay, go ahead. Do you guys go over the sustainable development goals uh, or do any survey about re relevant to them specifically? UN goals. Them again, the survey about sustainable, sustainable development. development goals, the UN sustainable development goals. Yes, I actually have, I start my classes with pre-class survey because I want to know what my students already know. I want to know what classes environmental they have taken and what is their prior knowledge on different topics, right? That I will be covering in a class. And one of them, especially um, in both classes I actually ask about sustainable development goals. So I want, I want to know if they know what they are and how to achieve them. Because then at the end of the class, you know, because I covered that in my class. At the end of the class, I asked the same survey and I see what they have learned. So I have to ask you about that after this because we can get credit in this Ishi stars for that. But then I also wanted to suggest to, to everybody that there should be something on the website that go into detail about the, the accomplishments, the recent accomplishments of what you guys are working on. Uh, like that environmental justice workshop, like all the, uh, where you got published a new book uh, about um, or an exhibition that you've had. Yeah, I mean, we have, if you, if you go to publications, um, it includes faculty publications, but also creative projects. So you'll find um, Karen's theater productions there, Mary and Milano's art ex exhibits, uh, the film festival is listed there. So under, you'll, you'll find it under the publication tab. Well, actually, I, I don't know who's updating it. Cause I know, I think Kate- I'm, I've been, uh, I've been working on that. Oh, you have been too, okay. Cause I, I, cause I haven't been getting all this. So yeah. good to know. Okay, thanks. Thanks Lizzie. And I, just in the interest of time, there was Margaret and then Jennifer, so, Margaret. So, um, so this may be a little micro, Milena, but um, when you asked, you asked a question about facilities on campus. I forget how you, what the- Oh, how did I, how did I collaborate it? Yeah, um, one of the well, things- a couple of years ago, we Can I just ask my question? Can I just oh, ask sure. my question? Um, so when I walk around campus, remember that, <laughs> um, I always notice that the recycling bins to me are not clearly labeled. And I keep looking until I find one that clearly says plastic bottles go here, hands go here. 
And um, I wonder if your students have remarked on that or if you've ever asked the facilities department or whichever department it is, how they perceive how well we are recycling on campus. Actually, we did. Um, when, when Steve Baxman was still part of the facilities department, we did collaborate with him on a couple of different um, things. We, we suggested some of the solutions. Um, one was also about recycling. And then also um, we collaborated with them regarding the elevators. We actually made a sign, the poster design for the elevators because students sometimes don't know, or escalators, you know, why they're working, let's say escalators sometimes are turned off, um, but we want to save the energy. So my students then uh, talk with Steve Axman and we develop some kind of a design to inform other students, what is that all about, right? And, um, and regarding the recycling, um, that's another thing that I like to cover, even though it's very basic, we all know it's recycled, we are trying to recycle, but Believe it or not, many students don't know how to properly recycle. They don't know those basic things. So I cover that. I cover that in the class. Um, but yeah, it's also, it's also more. true that recycling has been overhyped. I mean, yes. you know, That's true. most, That's most true. of what gets recycled never, it stays, you know, yeah. never is recycled. That's true. So That's true. We also many of our students that. think that if they're recycling, and I hear this, I recycle, you know, that's, right. not, it's not a solution. that's not an answer. It's not yeah. sufficient. Alas. That's why I always ask, do you reuse <laughs> and reduce? And, and do you think about reducing your that The individual solution is not the solution. We can all be perfect on this panel. We're not. None of us are, right? None of us do everything we should do. But that won't make a bit of difference. No. We need public policy and the public interest and and to put it on individuals. I mean, we should be advocating for, for the Green New Deal, et cetera, et cetera. And we should understand those connections between personal choice and public policy. Right. You know, and and right. you know, global north, global south, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I just wanted to add something about the whole facilities maintenance issue in that our student um, council, the last, the one from last year, um, led by Musarat, were, were really wonderful. I mean, Mus was one of my EK students and really included EK issues in everything they, everything the student council advocated for. Um, so the students have definitely been pushing. Um, the other thing is that um, Herbicide Free Campus, which is a nonprofit started by a student who got actually the entire University of California system to go herbicide free. Mm -hmm. He was a student athlete that actually talked to the grounds people, um, mainly because they were spraying and they couldn't practice. And that's when she found out about all the pesticide spraying on their campuses. And they actually convinced the grounds people to let the student athletes pull the weeds. And through the process, they started to learn more and it turned into an entire nonprofit. They got the entire Hawaii Board of Ed public schools to go herbicide free. Anyway, so one of our students actually got the fellowship last year by Herbicide Free Campus. And they were just in the process of um, having meetings with our maintenance and such um, about this very issue of what we are inject ingest, um injecting into our green roof um, when the lockdown happened. And unfortunately, those meetings never happened and probably the spraying is, con I'm, I'm sure it's still continuing. There's also the divestment movement, which is a also student movement to divest from fossil fuels. Right. The university is another important initiative. And the students also got some of the water bottle refills um, that are in our campus. So there has been uh, initiatives that the students yeah, have done. Just because we're running short on time, I just want to be, be sure that Jennifer also gets a chance to ask her question. Jennifer, why don't you go ahead? Um, actually, it wasn't a question. Um, nice to see everybody. Okay. We've all been away for so long. 
Um, but I was just want, I just, uh, Lindsay asked about the sustainable, the uh, sustainable development goals. And I just wanted to let everyone know that Rosemary Barbary from sociology is working on a new class. That's going to be one of the like 200 transfer classes, let's so specifically justice oriented transfer classes. And it's going to be created around the sustainable development goals. Like it's, that's the topic of the class. And her hope with that is that, um, it will essentially then sort of introduce transfers to the sustainability program and to the ICJ program. So that's exciting for us. Okay, okay great. Oh, great. Uh, thanks for letting us know. I'll actually send an email to her. Uh, I didn't know about this, so it's just. Yeah, she checked in with me and Gohar because she knows us from ICJ stuff. Yeah. So. Yeah, no, it's good. It's good to know then, you know, I can also let Sandra know if we just all are in, in touch about that. That's yeah. really good to hear. Yeah, yeah. So just sharing that. Great, thanks. We have we have five minutes left in this session, and so we you know we we should open it up for general questions. Or or Karen, if you want to say a word about the larger goals of, of your course, because you were cut short there for a moment, but you know just want to open it up for any final questions. Margaret, please. So are you, are the graduates of this program finding career positions in the field um, of environmental justice? I think whatever field anybody goes into now, whether it's teaching, nursing, law, I mean, you name it, environmental justice is going to be part of their field. True. And so I think they, the carrying of this knowledge into wherever they go is, is, is crucial. I, I can't say that um, I'm in touch with a bunch of the grads and some of them who are actual minors and it, it's a mixed bag. You know, there are some that are, you know, in the process of going through law school with an environmental focus. Um, I know some that are looking into doing things like urban design with a sustainability focus. Um, and then others who actually have gone into it and then left, um, you know, had some jobs, uh, you know, things like at Fab Scrap and other, and then the Walden Free Foundation. And a lot of those jobs came from their connections at John Jay. And then interestingly enough, ended up doing something else, which makes infinitely more money, but enables them to be able to afford to be <laughs> doing more environmental work, um, which is interesting. So uh, I know of two such cases like that. One of my very good students from uh, last spring, I just wrote a recommendation for graduate school in psychology. She works with autistic children um, now and she wants to continue that work. But, but as I say, this, this knowledge goes everywhere with where yeah. everybody goes. I had an EMT guy, uh, uh, an emergency uh, ambulance guy, and he, he did a, a paper on plastic. I mean, he started, we all are confronted by the amount of plastic that's being used in the medical profession. And of course the pandemic has made that much, much, much worse in every, every way. So again, I think the knowledge goes everywhere and should. There's no field that's unaffected by climate disaster. And I think, I mean, this also speaks not only to the initial goal for the program and minor, but also for this series. I mean, we offer a minor uh, that's specifically meant to inform the thinking of the students in their majors so that whatever career they go into, um, they have the knowledge to, to carry that forward into, you know, whatever place they work to make the change in, in the place that they're um, trained for in their majors. Um, so it, again, in the spirit of making sure that those, all those questions, which really affects everybody and anybody, no matter where they go, no matter what they do, are integrated into the the majors at the college and, and hopefully across the curriculum. Um, so I, I do hope that, you know, today and the other upcoming panels in this series will be helpful to just generate ideas of ways that you and your individual fields can integrate maybe, you know, units into your courses to just create those 
synergies or maybe collaborate with, with other faculty. Um, and just because we are short on time, one thing before I forget it, if, if anybody is interested, the environmental justice program has a listserv um, and a lot of information also goes out through that listserv that you know people share about ongoing projects and news. Um, so if anybody here is interested, um, send me an email. Uh, my email is also on the TLC website. I can also put it in the chat at the end. Um, and I'm happy to um, add you to our program listserv so you're in, in touch with us. Um, and just wanna say real quick that the next event in this series will be on March 16th. Um, when um, Gohar Petrosian from Criminal Justice, Sandra Swenson from Science, uh, and Guido Giordano, um, who is a graduate of the MA program in International Criminal Justice and is now teaching in, in the Environmental Justice program, will be talking about um, environmental and wildlife crime um, and ways to integrate those issues um, across the curriculum. Um, so I just want to thank Gina again, I want to say hello to Dean Byrne who arrived shortly before. Um, and just thanks to all of you again for coming. Uh, Gina, do you want to say anything in closing? Hello, Dara. So glad everyone showed up. Thanks for being persistent about getting in if you had issues and we are recording and we'll have this available in the next couple of weeks for everyone to see. Take care, everyone. Thanks so much. Thank Thanks everybody for coming. Really appreciate it. Take good care.